Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now by the time of supper, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands, that he had come from God, and that he was going back to God. So he got up from supper, laid aside his robe, took a towel, and tied it around himself. Next, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I'm doing you don't understand now, but afterward you will know. You will never wash my feet ever, Peter said. Jesus replied, If I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. One who has bathed, Jesus told him, doesn't need to wash anything except his feet, but he is completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you, for he, for he knew who would betray him. This is why he said, you are not all clean. When Jesus had washed their feet and put on his robe, he reclined again and said to them, do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord. This is well said, for I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. I assure you, a slave is not greater than his master, and a messenger is not greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Thanks very much, uh, Faye, for that reading. Good afternoon, everyone. I didn't say good morning, so I didn't make that uh, mistake. So anyway, we're going to continue on our service. Uh, sorry, we're going to continue on our series, and this one is on uh, service. And I wanted to start off by thinking about that passage, and we're going to get to it later on. So just keep that in the back of your mind. One of the most beloved passages of Scripture tells us a lot about Jesus and tells us a lot about ourselves. And so I wanted to uh, briefly outline where we're going to go today. We're going to look at services as it, what is it not or what is it and compared to what is it not in the sense of let's eliminate some of the things that we can get it confused. It's such a huge topic and um, everyone's got in their minds, many of you sitting out there, uh, who have served in the capacity of some form or, or another has uh, got your own concepts and we're going to take a look at that as well. What is a servant? And we're going to kind of focus on the qualities of a servant. Of course, we're going to look at our greatest example and then our greatest human example. And then we're going to uh, take a look at what service actually looks like in a Christian context. And then we'll end up with our reflections. And we'll take a look at those as we ponder some of the things that we've uh, considered today. And so what is it not? So service in the Greek is translated a certain way. In some English translations, it actually can say worship. So if you think of uh, Romans 12, acceptable service sometimes is tra translated as acceptable worship. And that's all fine, but we're not going to deal with worship in this context. We're going to be listening to a sermon in worship in March at some time, and we'll, we'll leave that aspect of worship. I mean, we can, it's funny how we've used to call this the service, and now we've called this the worship. And we'll, I'll leave that for another time to talk about that. The other thing is compared to what we were looking at last week on submission. Now, there's a lot of overlap between service and submission, especially in light of that passage we just read. But submission has its own characteristics, and I think Dave definitely fleshed those things out, and I'm going to be looking at a different aspect as we look in the Christian walk in our, in our Christian lives. And also, we also are going to build on what we did the last time before that, which was community. So we went community, then we went into submission, and then we'll end and service, although we'll continue in our, in our resilience series, but from the standpoint as those kind of come together uh, with service, culminating those three. 
So what I really want to focus on is what service as what we would understand in the Christian context as ministry. Now, it's not strictly going to be labeled that way, and we'll see how this, the scriptures are unpacked and uh, as we, uh, we go through the sermon today. So, thinking about that, we're looking at a Christian context. So, for those who do not claim that they're Christian, you'll say, well, in, this, in, in the world I live in, we do a many acts of service. You don't necessarily have to be a Christian to carry on acts of service. And I fully agree with that. I think that those who uh, naturally serve their family, naturally serve people in their neighborhood, naturally serve people in the workplace, in the schools, wherever you are. And that's the word, naturally. Where do you get that from? Well, we can have a debate about whether environmentalists believe that uh, the theory of evolution has created an inhumanity, a moral code, somehow. But that's not today's sermon. But what we could say from the Christian perspective, and the answer from the Christian perspective, is that God gave that to you naturally. An individual is born, has what we would say, common grace. We would also say that God has built in this moral code that we follow what is wrong and what is right, what is good and what is evil. And so many of our neighbors, friends, and many people in the world carry on acts of service. But their motivation or their uh, character could be um, with a different worldview. And we've always brought in this concept of worldview where we're chasing either accolades from uh, individuals, we're chasing status as we move up the chain, we're chasing wealth in the sense of somebody's going to give me back what I've given them, and so it's kind of like a scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. And so there is so many things at play when people are, are performing acts of service without the Christian context. We want to bring it to what Scripture will tell us, what our acts of service in a Christian context and what motivates us to do that. And so, as we move to focusing on the fact that we're looking at service from the standpoint of a ministry, what is a servant? Well, we can go to our um, foundational structure of a Christian is to love God and love man. So, the, many places in Scripture, and one particular place, a uh, scribe, otherwise known as a lawyer, went to um, the Lord and said, I want to know what the greatest commandment is. And of course, he was doing that not to find out what the greatest commandment was. He was trying to trap the Lord Jesus Christ in that. And he comes back and the Lord says simply, follow the greatest commandment and this is it. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And another one is like it, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. And so if that is what a servant does, how does he do it? And one of the things that we sometimes get caught up even in the Christian context is the external acts of service. And it's the idea of looking at what motivates us. And I pause here to say, let's look at these quotes here. We exist to serve others and die, just like our founder. Now that, without context, looks pretty depressing. And I did that for effect. Uh, but um, that is the reality of the Christian world view. After salvation, there's really two streams, service and stewardship. And everything flows from that. And the quote is really telling us, really, the ultimate is you just serve, you die, just like our founder. And that founder is Jesus Christ. 
And then G.K. Chesterton has a wonderful, just a little quote to, to remember of what drives that service to die for others. And really, the basis of it is humility. And I don't think we can do any of these things without having a humble heart. And really, ultimately, that's what the Lord wants from us, is our heart. And so when G.K. Cheston says, it's not the peak we're looking for. It's not the top of the mountain. It's in the bottom rung of the ladder. It's in the deepest, darkest valley. And when you're as low and as down there, you see everything. What can you see when you're on the mountaintop? There's nothing around you. And so um, we're going to unpack how that plays out in Scripture. And so how do we train our hearts? What, what's going to grab us that's going to drive us and motivate us to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, to love God, and to love man? And I think there's at least three things in Scripture and we can turn to it if you have your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we have Bibles in the back. Matthew chapter 20. And there's, uh, in the Synoptic Gospels of Mark, Matthew, and Luke, this passage comes up in all three. Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 to 28. And this is just after John and James handpicked by the Lord Jesus Christ to be in his inner circle, wondered among themselves, who is the, the greatest? Or they actually wanted to know who was going to be on the right hand, on his right hand, and who's going to be on his left hand. And the Lord breaks into the conversation in uh, verse 25. But Jesus called them over and said, you know how the rulers of the Gentiles dominate them and the men of high position exercise power over them. It, not, it must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and he gave his life a ransom for many. Now that's a, a lot in there. Two things, three things come out of there. One thing I didn't uh, distinguish when we talked about the word servant, and this is very controversial, it really means in the Greek, the Greek is doulos, D-O-U-L-O-S, and that is the word slave. But the English translators did not like the fact that we would be called a slave of Christ, and the concern, of course, was slavery and what was going on in the world at that time. And that word slave in first century Palestine and the Roman Empire had a completely different connotations and different meaning as it does in the slave trade that took place in the uh, 1400s all the way up until the abolition in the 18, uh, late 1800s. And that is the horrific slavery uh, of that took place whereas in first century and in those times there would probably have been a million slaves in Rome and how they operated was that they were treated much differently than the slaves uh, during the time of the translation of the of into English translations and so there's another expression in some of the, your uh, translations that say bond servant, which gets us closer there. A bond servant actually talks about us willingly becoming a slave. A bond servant would be glad to, to get his, uh, uh, his ears pierced with a dowel and, and then uh, he'd be marked by his master and he would give himself freely uh, to that master. And that brings us closer to it because um, just saying servant doesn't really get behind the text. And so here 
distinguish that. And, and the Holman Christmas uh, translation does a great job of picking up where the word slave should be put in there instead of servant or bond servant. Second thing you notice is that what is Jesus saying here? What's the crux of this passage? He is not just turning authority on its head in the sense of reversing the order. So it's not this, the great are at the first and the, and the least are last. And then he says, no, the great is least and the least are great. He's smashing it. He's totally destroying any rule of authority. He's just abolishing it all. He's saying we're all on the same playing field. There is no, and the way that we get there is the attitude of the greatest is the least and the least is the greatest. But he's smashing it all to bits. And so when you put that in your mind, in your mantra, you start to think of how do I get the heart of a servant that would follow Jesus? The second one is humility. Now we've seen this passage of John chapter 13. But Tori just read something earlier in in the worship, and I'm going to read it, and David read it last week as well, Philippians 2. If you want to turn to your Bibles, Philippians 2, verses 1 to um, 8. And again, this is written, if you look at your English translation, it's in a kind of a a acrostic, not acrostic in the sense of uh, following letters, but it's it's in a form of a poem because we believe that the early Christians read uh, verse 5 through to 11 as a poem, a song that they would sing. So P- Paul's writing to his uh, believers in, in Philippi, and he says this at verse 1. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fill my joy by thinking the same way, having the same love, Share the same feelings. Focus on the one goal. Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus. Some would say, Have the same mind as Christ Jesus. You want a heart that is going to be a servant's heart? You've got to have the heart and mind of Jesus. And it's possible. It's possible in the here and now. Just finished off authority, and here we show the heart of a servant. And why? It talks about who Jesus is and what he did for us. Who, in verse 6, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming a form of a slave. Now, that would be very controversial to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ as a slave, taking on the likeness of men, And when he had come as a man in his eternal form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. And so there starts to shine a little light for us, I hope, as to what this idea of humility consists. So if you wipe out authority, you bring on humility. And then the third aspect, let's turn to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, similar to the one we saw in uh, Matthew. This one's a little different though. Instead of them saying, I want to be on your right and I want to be on your left. It's like, I want to have some status. I want to have some power. I want to have a title. I want all these things the world has. So, you know, they're comparing themselves to the religious order of the day, the Roman Empire. And so James and John are just doing this kind of thing about, let's see, you know, we were kind of the first hand pick. We were those fishermen that nobody cared about. Jesus plucks us out 
theoretically from the water uh, out of the fishing boat anyway and uh, puts us on our, our right and I think we're the ones that are capable of doing that and, and I we got all those qualities and we want that and this one it's all of them now Mark chapter 9 and verse 33 to verse 37 then they came to Capernaum and when he was in the house he asked them what were you arguing about the way and he's talking about all of them but they were silent <laughs> they got busted is really what happened because on the way they had been arguing with one another who was the greatest. Here's the 12 now arguing amongst themselves. First of all, the other 10 were indignant when John and James did this about the right and the left. Here all 12 of them um, were arguing with one another about who was the greatest. And so sitting down, of course the great form of a, of a great teacher, he called the 12 and he said to them, if anyone wants to be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. He then took a child, had him stand among them, taking him in his arms and said to them, whoever welcomes one little child such as this in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but he, him who sent me. Once again, you've seen the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ right then. He could have just said, who sent me and left it. Or sorry, he could have just said, uh, welcomes me. But he stops to give deference and, and reverence and respect to his father as he points everyone, if you're going to welcome me, you're actually going to welcome the one who sent me. He's talking about his father. But thinking about the, uh, the word picture there of, of, a, of a child, where does that get us? Like, how do we get a child on the fact of who's the greatest? Well... We've said this here before, a child in the first century Palestine was basically hopeless. They didn't have a social net that we have now to take care of uh, a child that would have been orphaned. Um, they don't have the wherewithal to, to make it out through the day. They'd be beggars uh, looking for their next meal and, and most likely getting not much at all. And so they are completely dependent on others. And if in this case they were still with their family, they'd be completely dependent on their parents. If they were orphans, they would be completely dependent on the generosity of that community. But other than that, they had no social status, they had no rights, they had nothing. And so here, the idea about who's the greatest, is this interdependence of an individual with God. You do not have any status or bearing or anything unless you're tethered to God. Otherwise, you're out there on your own, fighting on your own. And in our Western world, it's called the rat race. In other places, it's called the climbing up to the top. In other places, it's stepping on everyone around you to get over and ahead of, of someone. Um, that chain and that cycle doesn't get broken, by the way, through cultures, because it's pretty similar elsewhere throughout the world. There is class systems that still exist today that were instituted millennia ago that still have not been broken and torn down. So when you're coming back and saying, okay, the qualities of a servant, you don't have this idea of authority, it's smashed. The humility is our mantra. Self-righteousness in this one here about who's the greatest is turned away. So, so give us something more concrete than that. And I agree, we need something more concrete. Scripture points us the way, but it points us to a person. And that person we're going to start actually with God the Father. Just think of it. Who could have a more defined role as a servant than God the Father? And you say, well, hold on. What are you calling God a servant? Now? Yes, God the Father. For instance, creation. Have you thought of it? Why did he have to even create anything? He was serving us. He was creating us. It doesn't end there. Adam, left alone. Oh, it's not right for him to be alone. 
enters Eve. And then they sin. What does he do? Oh, oh, you guys. No. He slays animals and gives them garments to cover themselves. Then what does he do? Well, you can go through the whole revelation of Scripture. It's funny, earlier uh, Dave had asked me, what's the passage you're going to preach on? I said, well, start with Gen- uh, Gen- Genesis and we'll go through Revelation. And he goes, and then I said, well, in the beginning there was service. No, okay. But anyway, and so take Abraham. Guy's 100 years old. Promised that his offspring will have the sea of the sand, uh, sorry, sands of the sea, and um, endless. And uh, whoever blesses uh, you, uh, will bless, you will bless them, and whoever uh, curses you, you'll curse them. And Isaac comes out. His name means laughter because Sarah laughed at 90 years old, saying, Am I going to have a child at 90? Again, God's serving. And then ultimately it comes down to the Lord Jesus Christ. Provided a way. Before the foundation of the world. He says, you will go. The one who was sent. We just saw that. Who sent me. The one that was sent went on a cross. The one that was God went on a cross. The one that was, and don't forget, don't ever pack Christmas away. What are you you talking about? Well, we're always packing Christmas away. We we have these crates that go up to the ceiling full of our Christmas stuff. Not the Christmas stuff, but the Christmas story. Never leave the incarnation out of your faith and your walk. It is what makes us incarnational in the community. That's what drives us, is because he came here to indwell with us. Now we can do the same and indwell in others. At your workplace, your neighborhood, within your family. Never pack the Christmas story away. And so we have this wonderful father, loving father. We sing about him every Sunday. We praise him. We lift him up. And then we have, on top of all that, Jesus And we're going to turn now to John chapter 13. And we're going to take some time. John chapter 13. Foot washing has been adopted in many different facets and forms. Some churches take it on after baptism and communion. They have a foot washing covenant. I don't know if you know this. The Mennonites are big foot washers. So get your towels ready the next time you're here. Uh, We even have it in our current uh, confession of faith. Foot washing would be a sign of humility and service. So uh, not tonight. I'll get mine another night. That's okay. Thanks. So let's look at this passage. Turn to John chapter 13, verse 1 to 16. And every verse matters, but we're not going to spend too much time with Peter. He's kind of got his foot in his mouth again. But we're going to see the first few verses are are powerful. Before the Passover festival, verse 1. So we're in Passover. That gives us a point of reference. Where are we? Now we are at the last days of Christ on earth. It's just before the cross. But Passover also talks about a people and and its identity with God, the creator, And, of course, the whole Passover message and story replicated in a different form with Jesus on the cross. He is our Passover. Jesus knew that his hour had come. His hour had come. His ministry was coming to an end. His time on earth was coming to an end. He was going to say goodbye to the 12 apostles. He was going to say goodbye to his mother, his sisters, his brothers, his followers, his disciples. He had come to depart from this world to the Father, not his earthly father, Joseph, his heavenly father, his God, 
Having loved his own who were in the world, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The uttermost end is really the, the impact of the Greek behind that. The uttermost end. To the end of ages and ages. Eternity is really what he's talking about there. Now, at the time of supper, the devil had already put in the heart of Judas Simon the Iscariot's gun to, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands and he had come from God, and he was no going back to God. Now let's stop that at verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had given him everything to in his hands. So he's now creator. He has the authority of all things. So he has all the authority. He has the creation. He has everything. Now what about this phrase? That he had come from God and that he was going back to God. Does, do any of us in the audience... Recite that every morning. We're coming from God. We're created by God. He put us on this earth before the foundation of the world. But we're going to him. Don't for lose ever sight of where we're going after this life. We're going back to God. And if you know you came from and you're going back, what can harm us? What's in the middle? You go to Romans 8 and you see all the different things that come and attack us and none of that attacks us. Nothing. So what is he going to do? He's God now. He's not just a teacher, a carpenter, a rabbi, a lord, all that. So he got up and he went from supper, laid aside his robe, took a towel and tied it around himself. A normal Jewish service however, performed by a slave. They're all sitting around the table, the 12 of them, and Jesus and they're like, oh yeah, who's going to clean our feet? Like, we don't eat until somebody cleans our feet. Now, foot washing, all the sentimentality around it in the day and age here does not even begin to unpack what that meant then. When these people were walking in their villages with sandals, they would walk into the sand, the dirt, the donkey dung, even worse, all of that caked on their feet. We didn't have nice shoes. Oh, I did bring some socks to show you some socks. Socks and shoes and all, like foot washing has no significance now in, in, in light of this foot washing. But it wasn't even the act of service. It was the heart of service that we're seeing there. And so they're all sitting there going, ah, uh, Where's the slave? Who's going to do our feet? The meal is here. And shock and awe, he wraps the towel around, and one by one, well, let's think about those one by one. There's 12 of them. Peter's going to put his foot in his mouth very shortly. But who's Peter? Oh, yeah, he was the denier. He was going to swear on the Bible there swear to God that he did not know this man. The Lord God wipes his feet, washes his feet. Thomas, a couple of weeks from here, he's going to deny, uh, sorry, he's going to doubt that he even rose. Ah, if I don't see him, I, I, I don't believe any of you guys. Matthew, Tax collector, enemy of, enemy, uh, public enemy number one, by the way, for Israel. Worse than the enemy, he was actually a traitor. Working for the Roman government to tax the Jews and make the Romans rich and the Jews poor. He is in this long line of getting his feet washed. Thanks to um, our little game at Russell Gardens today was uh, the Zealot. Mary, where are you? The Zealot. Yes, Judas, the Zealot. He wanted to overthrow the government. An insurrectionist. He wanted to take down the Roman government and the Jewish Sanhedrin. And he is getting his feet washed. Finally, as we refer to him, Judas the betrayer, the one that sold 
his beloved teacher and Lord for 30 shekels. He betrays him to the Romans to go to the cross. These are the people that the Lord Jesus Christ was watching. Do you have any of these in your life? Do you have any of these at work? Do you have these in your family? In your neighborhood? Wherever you sojourn? You're to wrap yourself in a towel, get down, and wash his feet. You know what's comparable to now? Maybe you can just turn off the recording at this time. Wiping somebody's bum is pretty much comparable to what it is now. And, uh, you know, as we get older, and I'm talking to a very young crowd, so this only applies to me. Um, when you get older, you start to lose those functions, and it's the most degrading thing is the fact that you're losing control over your personal hygiene and things like that, and you get really, really all worked up about it. Thankfully, I haven't got there yet, but that's what it's comparable to now. The lowest of lowest, but it's not even the act because the conversation goes on. The conversation, we're going to skip over the uh, Peter uh, and then we'll just get cut back into the story in verse 10. One who has bathed, Jesus told him, doesn't need to wash anything except his feet, but he is completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you, for he knew who would betray him. Okay, he just washed the betrayer's feet, right? So if you're thinking, well, I think you're reading too much. No, he knew it. Uh, this is why he had said, you are not all clean. When Jesus, verse 12, when Jesus had washed their feet and put on his robe, he reclined. So it, all 12 were washed and he put on his robe and he reclined again and said to them, do you know what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord. This is well said, for I am. So if I, your teacher, sorry, your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Now, slight change in calling him teacher and Lord, so they may come to him and realize he's a teacher to them first, and then over time he developed as their Lord, the one that they would obey, Adonai in the Greek. But he turns it on them. I'm your Lord first. Oh, and by the way, I am a teacher, and many other things. But don't forget who I am. Revelation, the Lord's teaching them, trying to get them to see who he is. And then he says this, For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. Jesus leads by example. Peter says it. Paul says it. They all say it. When they come down to it, we don't look to anyone else except for Jesus. Because think about it. The Israelis were, had the full Old Testament scriptures and whatever rules and stuff. And they had all these commandments to follow. And, and all that was great. But, but they just couldn't get it. And then there, there's someone that comes on the scene. A carpenter born in a manger. We saw the manger last time. It wasn't that cute, cuddly, little straw-filled, little bassinet thing. It was a feeding trough for animals. Yeah, that was, that was, his, that was his birthplace. He comes in that, those circumstances, and he says, do what I do. If I'm God, if I'm your teacher and Lord, Lord and teacher, if I'm everything you guys want me to be, I'm going to stoop and wash your feet, no matter what condition they are. So what do we have that we can compare now for washing feet? Well, we're encouraged in the scriptures to do all kinds of things. 
And so when we look at Romans 12, Paul says the following. If you have your Bible, Romans 12, verses 9 to 21. And mine says, Christian ethics. It says right on the top, Christian ethics. Another translation says, the marks of a true Christian. Pretty powerful statements. What does it say? Verse 9, love must be without hypocrisy. Detest evil. Every one of these phrases is going to turn your mind to something. Cling to what is good. Show family affection to one another with brotherly love. Here's my favorite. Outdo one another. Imagine a church that got together and they wanted to outdo each other. We want to outdo each other. Not for show, not for marks, not for gratitude. Just outdo each other in showing honor. Do not lack di dil diligence. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be persistent in prayer. Share with the saints in their need. Needs. Pursue hospitality. One of the hallmarks of this church that I am so thankful for is our desire for hospitality. Thank you to the Willards that opened their home to us on Friday night. Small example of that. Bless those who persecute you. Whoa, I, I, I'm not going to even unpack that one. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. I think we all love the rejoicing part. Praise and woohoo. Got a new job, new house. Somebody's getting married. Somebody's having a baby. Somebody's doing this, somebody's that. How's that cancer diagnosis going so far? How's that sudden heart attack working for you recently? How's that uh, job got fired the other day? House got burned down. Those are tough. Be in agreement with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. That whole authority thing, just do not be wise in your own estimation. That self-righteousness. These are words to me, by the way. I'm just sharing what I need to hear with you guys. Do not repay anyone for evil for evil. Sue can tell you on, on the road, I do my road rage thing. I like to pay evil for evil, let me tell you that much. Try to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. Not just everyone's eyes, that's the Lord's eyes too. You know the ones that you don't know, think are looking at you? If possible, on your part, live at peace with everyone. Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for his wrath. For it is written, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Sounds pretty basic. For in doing so, you will heap fiery coals on his head. Now, I could spend a whole sermon on fiery coals on his head, but I don't think you have to get to that. It's this old ritual they used to have done. And uh, anyway, at the end of the day, let's just go with it. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil. Conquer evil with good. Now that is 12 verses in scripture. Every one of those has got meaning for us today and always. Too long. Yep. Uh, that's only page one of, oh, it's only two pages. Whew. Peter does the same in 1 Peter 4, verses 7 to 11. We don't go, have to go there, but you guys can look at it. So to become like Jesus, confident in our own way, identity and calling, so confident that we become able not just to serve others in humility, but even to accept our own humiliating interdependence. It's enough to say that it takes a community to raise a child. Sometimes we always like to say that. It takes a community to put a church together. It takes a community to have the betterment of the community. 
in all that we talked about two weeks ago, considering what we learned last week and putting it together here tonight with service. So what does service look like? I've done this with you in one of our other sermons. We talked about life together, doing things together, doing things alone. And the part of doing things together, there are so many encouragements in the Word of God. We just saw Paul's list. Peter's list is very similar. We'll just quickly go over some of them. Uh, as simply as listening. When's the last time you listened to somebody? Like truly listened to somebody? And I'm saying this for myself because I could just ask Sue, when's the last time I listened to Sue? And she won't have very good report on that. But holding one's tongue, guarding the reputation of others. Have you ever thought of what comes out of the mouth before it hears, before it's heard by the listener? It's too late to put it back in. Hold your tongue. James 3 and 2. The same tongue that blesses uh, man made in God's image curses. Hospitality. We just talked about hospitality. Peter will encourage that in his, Paul did it in Romans. Hospitality. How about helpfulness? This is one I, I really like. Helpfulness is a, is a good story because there's a, I'm going to share this one little story with you. Richard Foster, our spiritual disciplines guru, in his book, Celebration of Disciplines, he writes a story of doing the small stuff or helpfulness. The following is a true story, because that's why I know it's true, because he said that. During the frantic final throes of writing my doctoral dissertation, I received a phone call from a friend. His wife had taken the car, and he'd wondered if I could take him on a number of errands, trapped I like that. Trapped. I consented inwardly, cursing my luck. Ooh, cursing my luck. And as I ran out the door, I grabbed Bonhoeffer's Life Together, the book we did, uh, or part of that we did uh, together, thinking that I might have the opportunity to read it. Through each errand, I inwardly fretted and fumed at the loss of precious time. Finally, at the supermarket, the final stop, I waved to my friend on saying, you know what, I'll just wait in the car. So I picked up the book and I opened it in the market and read these words from Bonhoeffer. The second service that one should perform for another in a Christian community is that of active helpfulness. This means initially simply assisting in trifling external matters. There's a multitude of these things wherever people live together. Nobody is too good for the meanest service. One who worries about the loss of time that such petty outward acts of helpfulness entail is usually taking the importance of his own career to solemnly. Powerful words. I'm caught doing this all the time. My mom calls and says, Tab, can you come? Mom, I'm reading right now. Really? Like, my reading is so important. I've got to study this thing. I'm doing a sermon or whatever, or a Bible study. I can't help you. Or other things just like that. Just in the midst of when you think you're doing Christian service, maybe inwardly, prayer, studying, reading, all good things. And then a call comes. We call that interruption. We hate interruptions. And that's when we're supposed to act. Those interruptions are not... Random. They're testing you. God-ordained interruptions will test you. And so, there's so much being served, bearing one's burdens, Galatians 2 and uh, 6 and 2, sorry, and of course our famous Matthew 11, 28 and 31, uh, 30, is that his burden is not heavy. And what does he say? He's low. And he calls us to come. Lots of stuff here, but just enough, I hope, to whet your appetite, enough to think about these things. Uh, we're going to turn to our reflections now. And um, as I do in normal, the first two are for us Christians to really focus and think about it. The other one is for those who may not 
identify as, as being a Christ follower? The first one, what would the neighborhood, the community, the city, the world at large look like if the church at large or Southeast City is motivated and driven by Jesus-shaped humble service? We saw a number of those examples. What, sorry, would we grow spiritually in Christ-likeness if we served in the same Christ-like humility that resembles the God we worship, the one that we sing about all the time? We know what he's capable of. We know what he does. Each day, in every way, as in, and I've, you know, specifically called out the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Each one of them plays role as a servant in humble service and have we could emulate and resemble them as in the way we worship them. And then for us who, for some of us who do, who do not follow Christ, does the Christian message of service as expressed this evening make you ponder about what motivates you to serve? But in this case, draw you closer to Jesus. And then a rhetorical, rhetorical question. Not fair when I line it up like that. Is Jesus, I should have said, is Jesus not the ultimate motivation for any act of service? So we'll end it there. Think about those things. Give you a few minutes to ponder those things. And then uh, we'll come back with a word of prayer. All right, well, let's, uh, let's uh, think about these things as we come to prayer before God. Heavenly Father, we're again thankful that you've given us a space to come together, to open up the Word, to contemplate our Lord Jesus Christ, to see Him as that humble slave that bowed down and took every one of His disciples, each of the apostles, one by one, and performed an act of service in humility just to show them the way, to provide an example for us. Father, you knew who made up those apostles, and yet even in the light of that, his own betrayer, his doubter, his denier, a traitor of the his own country, all would be subject to the same. Their foot washed before they sat down and had a meal together. Their last meal together, Father. And as Jesus knew them all, he loved them to the end. And knowing that he was from God, he was going to God. Father, we remember those precious words that remind us of who we are in Christ. Sinners saved by grace. The cross represents the greatest sacrifice in human history. The resurrection verifies that you accepted that sacrifice at such a great cost. Father, as we would encourage one another and spur each other on, love each other, serve each other, pour out ourselves, whether it's at home, neighborhood, workplace, school, Father, and, and the question of who is my neighbor, it's everyone. It's clear it's everyone. Nobody is immune from that definition. Nobody is cut out. All are grafted in to the wonderful story of the, of the Christian message of love, mercy, and grace. And so, Father, with thankful hearts, we thank you again for the wonderful sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that he is our greatest example. We pray all these things in his name. Amen.